Hello everyone, welcome to the Bee Borders here at Cambridge University Botanic Garden. I'm Beverly Glover, I'm Director of the Botanic Garden, and I'm here today to talk to you about plants and pollination as part of our virtual festival of plants. Now those of you who know the garden well would know that at this time of year we'd normally have our real festival of plants and we'd be welcoming thousands of visitors to the garden looking at its best. Uh, they'd all be here on the lawn behind me on the main lawn which you can see is not full of people and marquees. Uh, normally people would be here having fun with their families and learning about plants and plant science and horticulture from our team here at the garden. We're not able to do that today, which is a terrible shame because the garden does look so fantastic, but we thought we'd try and bring you some of the same content and interest in this virtual online format. So the idea today is that I'm going to tell you a bit about plants and pollinators and the science of how plants attract pollinators. Tomorrow's theme is about horticulture and there'll be a, a Twitter takeover in the afternoon where our hort staff will answer your gardening questions. And then Thursday's, team is, uh, Thursday's theme is about conservation and our curator Sam will be here to answer your questions and tell you about the work we do in preserving endangered plants. And on each one of these three days we're loading up lots of great extra content, talks and tours, movies to watch, uh, family content to engage with as well. So I do hope you'll enjoy this attempt to bring the Festival of Plants and its spirit to you in this virtual online way. Now I'm here today with Helen behind the camera and we're trying out this Facebook Live way of doing things. I'm going to ask Helen from time to time to focus in on plants here in the bee border and you'll just have to bear with us as I back off as she comes in because we're doing our social distancing. And Helen can also see the comments you type into the comments section on Facebook. So if you've got questions, please do type them in there. Helen will read them out and I'll be able to answer them or try to answer them as best I can. There's often a bit of a delay, 10 or 20 seconds, between you typing it in and us seeing it. So don't worry if we don't respond immediately. Hopefully we will pick it up and I'll be able to have a go at answering it while the session's running. So we're starting here at the bee border because it's the perfect place to introduce you to the science of pollination. I'm going to ask Helen to focus in on the purple salvia that she can see. She's walking towards it now. And you can see that that salvia is absolutely full of bees. There are at least two different sorts of bees easily visible. Uh, they've just flown away as we moved in. But there are some lovely big fat furry bumblebees. And there are also some slimmer honeybees working those flowers as well. But what are they doing? What are they actually working at? Well, when bees visit flowers, they're trying to get hold of food for themselves. And there are two main sorts of food that they're interested in. The first is something called nectar. That's a sugary solution that flowers make specifically to attract pollinators. It doesn't do anything for the plant. It's just there as bee food. And that nectar uh, provides lots of calories, lots of energy that gives the bees the energy they need to go flying, to go about their daily business. The other thing that they're collecting here in the flowers is pollen. And pollen is the yellow dust that you get on your hands if you brush flowers. Um, it gives us hay fever at this time of year. But it's packed full of protein. And so the bees collect the pollen and they take it back to the hive or the colony and they feed it to the bee larvae, to the baby bees. And that helps those bees to develop. They need the protein in their diet in order to grow up into, into full adult bees. So that's what the bees are doing. And you can see that when you look at flowers, you can watch bees behaving in different ways. So the bees that Helen just showed you are foraging um, particularly on the salvia flowers for nectar, but they're also getting pollen from them. Whereas some flowers provide more, not pe more nectar than pollen, others provide more pollen than nectar. And a really good source of pollen for bees is something like the borage flowers here, which I'm just showing Helen. There aren't very many open yet, but you can see those bright blue flowers have a really heavy cone of anthers, the male reproductive organs, in the centre of the flower, and those are full of pollen. So the borage flowers, as well as providing nectar, are also full of really good pollen, which the bees like to collect. So why are the flowers providing all of this food for bees? Why on earth would plants have evolved to do that? Well, the reason is to do with what else the pollen is. So as well as being full of protein for baby bees, pollen is actually a secret capsule that contains the male gametes, the sperm, if you like, of flowers. And that has to be got from the flower of one plant to the flower of another plant. Now that's hard enough for animals to do, but it's really hard for plants because they can't move around. So there's no going around looking for a mate. You've got to find some other way of getting your pollen containing that precious sperm from one plant to another. And the way that flowers do that is that they use pollinators. They attract animals by giving them something good to eat and the animals then pick up the pollen, carrying it to another flower when they go looking for more food, 
that transfers the pollen and that enables the flower to be able to produce seed um, and that gives us the next generation of plants. So the plants have evolved to do this, to attract the pollinators, because it allows their pollen to be carried around and them to reproduce. But there are lots and lots of animals you could attract as pollinators and um, they are different in size and shape and in the colours they can see and in the food they like the taste of and in the way they behave. And so over time, over millions of years, different sorts of plants have evolved in different ways to produce flowers that attract different pollinators. Now these borders are focused on bees and so you can see looking across them generally that there are some themes to what we're growing here. The flowers are blue and yellow, they're not generally red. And that's because bees have very poor vision in the red part of the spectrum and very good vision in the blue and yellow parts of the spectrum. So they tend to be more attracted to blue flowers and yellow flowers than they are to red flowers. But that's not the case for all pollinators. Many birds are particularly attracted to red. So flowers that are pollinated by hummingbirds, for instance, are often red in colour. And flowers that are pollinated by moths often don't make colours at all because moths don't have very good colour vision and are usually flying at night. So in the bee borders, we've gone with colours that bees can see easily. We've also thought about shape and size, because although I've just said to you that these borders attract bees, I'm, um, I'm taking a lot of different animals there and lumping them into one, into one pot. There are lots of different sorts of bees, and they vary in size and shape. They vary in the length of their tongue, and all of that affects which flowers they can visit, how big the flower needs to be, and how deep a tube they can dip their tongue into to access the nectar. And so we've tried here in the bee borders to have a range of flowers in different shapes and sizes, which will provide food to a range of different bees. The other thing that's really important when you're thinking about designing a, a border to attract bees is the timing. So bees are active and foraging from around March through till September, October, November each year, and they need food right across that season. Most of our gardens, including ours here at the Botanic Garden, are at their best in May and June, but it's important to be providing food for bees all the way through the year. So we've thought here about early flowering species and about late flowering species and about trying to make sure there's food for bees all year round. That's a really important thing you can do in your own garden if you're interested in attracting bees to it. Now in my research group we work on the flowers themselves. I'm a botanist, not a, not a bee person by background, and I'm interested in how the flowers make these different traits, how they produce the colours, how they produce the shapes and sizes that attract these different animals. And I'm interested in understanding how those things evolved as well. If you need a particular set of genes to make a flower blue, where did these genes come from? What are they doing in plants that don't have blue flowers or in plants that don't make flowers at all, like a fir tree? And so the work in my lab is focused on trying to understand all of this, how it evolved, how it gave us that enormous diversity of flowers that you can see here today in the bee borders. Now, I don't know whether anyone's got any questions yet on the, the Facebook page. Please do remember to type your comments in if there are things that you're seeing that you want to know about or hear more about. Uh, we'd be very glad to answer the questions. And what I can do is walk around and show you some of the sorts of traits that we're interested in. We've just had one question, I believe, saying, how do flowers attract moths? Ah, a question's just come in. I don't know whether you can hear Helen's voice on this system. Maybe they send thumbs up so they can hear you. <laughs> uh, the person said, how do flowers attract moths? It's a great question and there are lots of lovely plants that are pollinated by moths. Moths are actually really important as pollinators. There's been quite a lot of recent work showing that they're more important than we knew um, and that across the UK there are lots and lots of moth species doing pollination. So flowers that attract moths are often flowering at night. Many moths are night flying. In your own garden you might think about honeysuckle or some of the jasmines that have particularly strong scent in the evening. Those are often moth pollinated. Uh, but because moths don't have very good colour vision, those plants often produce white flowers. Uh, the scent is important though, moths have a very good sense of smell. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about moth pollinated flowers is the way moths handle flowers. So the bees we've been looking at here, they all land on the flowers to get their food. So they actually crawl into the flower. Whereas moths don't do that, they generally hover in front of flowers. And so if you're hovering to feed, you need the flower to be a very special shape. You don't want something that you have to land on and crawl around on. You want something that's held out away from the vegetation or that hangs below it so that it's easy for you to access. And so moth pollinated flowers, again, honeysuckle are a good example of sort of hanging in that way that uh, make, means they're easy to access and away from the leaves. We've also got a couple of nice ones from some children. Um, so Linda Hindmarsh has said, my daughter, who wants to be a plant technologist, 
would like to know what are the best bee friendly plants for a small back garden? <laughs> oh, I dread these questions. So what are the best bee friendly plants for a small back garden, says Linda's daughter. Uh, I, well, I'm not a horticulturalist and you might ask the same question tomorrow of our uh, of our hort team when, when they do their Twitter takeover. But I would say there are a few things you can't go wrong with. So they love borage. Um, that's the bright blue one we showed you earlier with the, the cone, the pointy cone of anthers, and they don't take up a lot of space. Uh, the other one that I would say is an absolutely surefire winner is the Phacelia. I don't know whether you can get in close to the Phacelia there, Helen. It's in the shade, so it hasn't actually got many bees on it at the moment. But you can see if you look closely at the flowers, the anthers sticking out away from the petals. They've got lots of easy access pollen for the bees, and it's got a lot of nectar. So they really do love Phacelia. So none of these are very glamorous plants. They're not going to make architectural little striking displays but if you've got a little patch you can just put a bit of seed in they'll come back year on year from seed um, they don't take a lot of looking after um, they're really colorful and the bees really will love them the other thing's lavender you can't generally go wrong with a lavender as far as bees are concerned and if you can just put one or two in pots in your garden that always works well to bring in bees as well we've got another question from richard's daughter evie she wondered how many species of bee we have at the garden Oh dear. Okay, so Richard's daughter Evie wonders how many species of bee we have at the garden. That's a great question. Uh, I don't know is the answer. Um, I know how many species of bee we have in the country and we have quite a lot of them here at the garden. So there are about 200, um, 250 species of bees in the UK. 24 of them are bumblebees, so those big black fluffy stripy ones that you see. Uh, there's the honeybee and the rest, 200 or so, are what we call solitary bees. So these are often much smaller, they look more like flies when you see them, and they're not in groups, they don't live in colonies or hives, they're on their own. Uh, but they're actually really important pollinators as well, and they enjoy all of this food we provide just as much as the honeybees and bumblebees do. We've got a plane going over, it's the first time in nine weeks making noise for us. Um, but I would say that uh, of all of those bee species, most of the bumblebees have been recorded here in the garden and we've got some great teams working on recording all of the insects that we have around the garden. Things like our bioblitz are great for that. So Evie, come along to the next one of those and find out about all the different insects we have here. So that's a good question. Do flowers change with time to be able to date with their favourite pollinators? Now I'm not sure whether that means... Um, okay, there are lots of different ways of answering that. So I'll, I'll give you a climate change answer, which is that we are monitoring at the moment whether the timing of flower production year on year is changing as the climate changes and whether the timing of insect growth is changing year on year as the climate changes. Because people are very concerned that those are going to end up mismatched, that um, flowers and, and pollinators do tend to be together at the same time but that if they change at different rates as the climate changes that might create real problems for pollination and for conservation and for survival of the animal species as well as the plants. Now some of the studies that are coming in are beginning to say that does look like a problem that some of the rates of change are different and people are using some really interesting historical approaches looking for instance at the timing of flower production in records and the timing of insect production from museum collections over the last 100 or 200 years and then there are other studies that say actually the animals and plants are a bit more flexible than we thought and maybe they will be able to adjust to get their dating timing right as you say so we don't know yet um, we'll see but certainly over time um, it's clear that there's a lot of selective pressure in an evolutionary sense acting on flowers and pollinators to get that timing right. And there are some plants, for instance, that have evolved to flower at early in the season or late in the season just to avoid competition with the majority of flowers which are out now. Oh, final question from Robin, and I'm being told that we've only got a minute of, uh, of, of time left. So Robin asks, why aren't there more blue flowers? Uh, and I'm showing you a beautiful border full of blue flowers, but you'll know from your own gardens that actually blue is quite rare, um, that very often the flowers that we see around us are red or pink. And that's actually because blue is very difficult for plants to make. It's a very difficult thing to do chemically. So the pigments that give us blue flowers are actually pinky purple in colour. The, the colour of the, the foxglove here, the digitalis, that's the sort of pigment that you need to start with to make blue flowers. No plant makes a really, really true blue pigment on its own. And then what you have to do is play with that pigment. So plants change the acidity of their cells, they make them more alkaline, and that makes the pigment look more blue. 
They can also use metal ions uh, bound into the pigment to change the wavelengths of light it interacts with, and that can make it more blue as well. But to do all of those things, you need a lot of uh, enzymes, you need a lot of chemistry, you need the right uh, minerals in the soil, and it's just been very difficult for many plants to evolve to do that. So we don't have very many true blue ones, but the ones we have are really striking and beautiful. So I think I should probably wrap it up now, um, but thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for all the questions. It's been really great to hear from you all. That's great. Helen's saying people from all around the world have been, have been uh, listening. That's wonderful to hear. If you've got more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Keep putting them in the comments box or email them in and we'll get back to you over the next few days with answers. Um, and please don't forget to join us again tomorrow for our Twitter takeover, on Thursday for another Facebook Live focused on conservation, and to have a look at all of the other content we're uploading each day. There are great talks and tours and videos and family activities to join in with. But most of all, I just want to finish by saying I'm looking forward to seeing you all in real life back here in the garden as soon as we possibly can. Thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye from me.